Good evening and welcome. I'm Megan Rust, the Frist Art Museum's educator for public programs. Thank you for joining us for Art, Marriage, and Family in the Florentine Renaissance Palace. Tonight's lecture is presented in conjunction with Life, Love, and Marriage Chess in Renaissance Italy, now on view in our upper, upper level galleries through February 18th. The exhibition was organized by Contemporanea Progetti with the Museo, Museo Stiebert in Florence, Italy. In addition, we would like to thank Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their ongoing support of the Frist Art Museum's exhibitions and programs. Thanks to Trinita Kennedy, Frist Curator, for organizing our presentation of this exhibition. I would also like to recognize two special guests who traveled here for this opening. Deletta Desara is the Exhibition Projects Manager at Contemporane Contemporanea Progetti, and Martina Beccatini is the Curator of Paintings and Furniture at the Museo Stiebert. We are honored to have Jacqueline Marie Masaccio here with us this evening to present tonight's lecture. Jacqueline earned her PhD from Princeton University and is a professor of art at Wellesley College. She is a specialist in Italian Renaissance and Baroque art. Her research focuses on the role of material culture in the Italian Renaissance life, encompassing everything from sculpted portrait busts and domestic devotional images to metalwork bridal girdles and embroidered widow's veils. She is the author of the French, or sorry, she's, author, she's the author of The Art and Ritual of Childbirth in Renaissance Italy and Art, Marriage, and Family in the Florentine Renaissance Palace. She has contributed to numerous exhibitions as a catalog, author, or curator, including Art and Love in Renaissance Italy, which was exhibited at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the Kimball Art Museum in 2008. Please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Muscaccio. Hello. Thank you, Megan, and thank you all for coming. I'm very pleased to be here today and to be part of this wonderful exhibition. Um, let me try to move things here a little. In August 1447, the Strozzi and Parenti families of Florence agreed to a marriage between their children. These were prominent families, deeply engaged with the political and economic elite of the city, and the marriage was a notable event. Caterina Strozzi was 16 years old. She was said to be beautiful, but like most women from this period, little else is known about her. Marco Parenti, however, wrote a chronicle of Florentine history as well as a lengthy memorandum detailing his lifetime expenses and activities. At the time of his marriage, he was 25, an educated and prosperous merchant, and fortunately for our purposes, a compulsive record keeper. The case of Caterina and Marco exemplifies how Renaissance Florentines of the middle and upper classes conducted their daily lives, lives where key events, marriages, births, and deaths, were accompanied by and mitigated with a broad range of objects, from marriage chests to devotional paintings, brass thimbles, terracotta statuettes, and everything in between, many of which you can see in the exhibition upstairs. Marriage initiated a household and its accumulation of possessions. Both grew as children were born, and they shrank when they died, a sad but frequent occurrence in the early modern era, or when they left it as adults. Death of the couple redistributed that household, or in some cases terminated it completely, and the possessions, treasured for their financial value and their emotional connotations, were absorbed into the life of another family or families to start the cycle again. The palaces or homes of Renaissance Florence that contained these families and their many objects are visible in this contemporary bird's eye view of the city. Their many windowed facades and stacked stories are nestled among both sacred and civic structures inside the fortified city walls, dominated by the dome of Florence Cathedral, which I hope you can see right there, and bisected by the Arno River and its bridges. Florence today looks much as it did then, which makes it a rather easy for us to imagine some aspects of life within the Renaissance city walls. Unfortunately, however, very few palaces retain their original objects, and the objects that do survive are often removed from their settings, damaged, or otherwise compromised. This is one reason, of course, that exhibitions like this and collections like the Stibbert are so vital to our understanding of Renaissance life. 
Representations in paintings, manuscripts, and other media can help recreate some of these objects, as can personal diaries, letters, civic legislation, estate inventories, sermons, and popular literature. Taken together, this evidence reveals how Florentines conducted their family life, surrounded by an amazing array of household objects that were functional, beautiful, instructive, and sometimes very entertaining, too. Since the accumulation of these objects really began with marriage, we need to understand how people married in the Renaissance. In almost every case, the decision to marry was not entrusted to the bride and groom alone. Families, friends, and neighbors all played an important part. The stakes to ensure a successful union were very high, as were most of the expenses. The bride's family had to assemble a suitable dowry, the combination of cash, investments, and goods given by the bride's father to her new husband in her name. The groom and his family then used at least some of these funds to provide a counter dowry, furnish the couple's home, and celebrate the marriage in an appropriately public manner. Both dowry and counter dowry objects came from specialized artisans, tradespeople, secondhand dealers, and even itinerant peddlers, like the one in this engraving. Down here, sleeping as monkeys, I hope you can see them, are playing with all of his goods. They've taken it out of the little basket over here, and they're looking at mirrors and wearing jewelry and playing with girdles and gloves and combing their hair with a comb. Um, all objects that would have been quite typical gifts to a bride at the time of her engagement and marriage. In Katerina Strozzi's case, her father provided her with dowry goods appraised at 165 florins, a total of 16, more than 16% of her 1,000 florin dowry. To put that into some perspective, an unskilled laborer in Florence's construction industry during this time might earn about 30 florins a year. So a 1,000 florin dowry was a significant amount. Katerina's dowry goods included many of the objects coveted by the monkeys in this engraving. Her father bought her five dresses and 17 lengths of fabric to make more dresses, as well as 17 embroidered shirts, 42 veils, 30 handkerchiefs, a basin and ewer with heraldic ornament, a book of hours, a, coral, a chain of coral beads, two silver-handled knives, a girdle with silver clasps, six silk caps, three needle cases, an embroidered handkerchief, two ivory combs, this keeps going, nine skeins of thread, 24 caps, a bunch of ribbons, three pairs of red stockings, four baskets, two pairs of slippers, one pair of shears, and two collars. Marco Parenti then spent an equally impressive 500 florins for Caterina's counter dowry, including a lined red silk velvet and fur trimmed overdress, a matching gown, and a garland for her head made of 800 peacock feathers, much probably like the one that you see this promenading woman wearing here on her head. I hope you can make out the little eyes of the peacock feathers there. Similar objects were cited in other documents and included in portraits that commemorated Florentine brides during this period, like these three associated with the painter Domenico Ghirlandaio. On the left, a woman named Costanza de' Medici has rings, pins, and a thimble arranged on the shelf in front of her. In the middle and at right are Giovanna degli Albizzi and an anonymous woman with their jewels, books of hours, little prayer books, and paternosters. These objects, visible in these and other painted portraits from the period, indicate that certain expectations and messages were inherent in the accumulation, gifting, and use of these objects. On a most basic level, the presence of these objects identified women as brides and wives. Many of them emphasized ideal bridal characteristics like beauty, fertility, piety, and duty. For example, beauty was enhanced by the extravagant costumes acquired and worn during the marriage process, like that peacock garland, these included dresses made from luxurious fabrics like those lengths that are displayed so wonderfully in the exhibition. Dress and the marriage it sent about an individual status was an important indicator in Florentine society and oftentimes a ruinously expensive part of marriage celebrations. Men who had less money than Marco Parenti sometimes borrowed clothing and jewels for their new wives, hiding their financial status under temporary glitter. Brooches for heads and shoulders, pendants for necks, and jewels for hair, like those shown in these two portraits, marked women as the property of their future husbands, or um, marked, marked women as the property of their future husbands. 
ivory or bone combs, painted, gilt, or carved with lovely figural scenes, helped keep their hair controlled, as did hairnets, called by the evocative term vespaya or wasp nest, made of fine silk or metallic threads and sometimes adorned with jewels. Women had mirrors made from small pieces of polished metal or blown glass set in a frame, like the example in this detail from a painting of the virtue prudence. Other mirrors had ivory or bone frames, while still others were cast from molds, like this myolica or tin glazed earthenware frame, which depended on more expensive examples, like this marble frame by the Florentine sculptor Mino da Fiesole. In both cases, a piece of reflective metal would be attached to this roundel that you see here at the bottom, allowing the woman to see herself and then look up and see her resemblance to the beautiful woman represented in the frame itself. Other objects emphasize the real goal of marriage during this period, which was raising a family. Paintings like this one of a Madonna adoring the infant Christ from the exhibition might be included in a dowry or counter dowry to remind the bride of her future role. Florence, like other cities on the Italian peninsula, was devastated by recurring plague outbreaks in the 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. And these outbreaks reduced the population as much as one half to two thirds. This focused enormous attention on pregnancy and childbirth as a necessary means to perpetuate the family and the city, ensuring a prosperous future. Symbols of fertility, like the belt or girdle, like the one shown here, were popular gifts that drew attention to the bride's body. The connection between girdles and fertility is related to the belief that the virgin's girdle, a precious relic kept in the town of Prato near Florence, was an aid to women in labor. You would put a little thread next to the virgin's girdle, the actual relic in Prato, and then take that piece of thread away and tie it around your wrist or your finger as a sort of talisman to help you have a successful birth. The girdle shown here is almost six feet long, woven silk studded with colorful enamels of people and fantastic beasts. The end would have dangled to the ground when the woman walked, clinking and catching the light as she moved. Girdles, in fact, were such popular bridal gifts that they were made for the open market, not just on commission, and they appear hanging from racks in representations of goldsmith shops from this period, like these two, over the heads of the artisans at left and against the side wall at right, ready for purchase by prospective grooms. As the Madonna painting I just showed you implies, Renaissance Florence was a predominantly Christian society and brides needed to be pious. Illuminated and printed prayer books, or books of hours, were popular dowry items. But low literacy rates meant that they were often for display rather than actual reading, with extravagant bindings and clasps, like the two visible in these details from the Ghirlandaio portraits I showed you earlier. Strings of paternosters, or rosaries, made of precious materials like coral, were also popular dowry items that appeared in painted portraits. And some brides received life-size dolls made of wood, stucco, or terracotta to play with and care for like real children, like the examples carried by the 16th century girls in these paintings. In 15th century Florence, bridal dolls often represented the Christ child or a saint, and they were dressed up in extravagant costumes and crowned. Finally, dowry objects like the needle case, thimble, and spindle whorls, these myolica spindle whorls shown here, along with thread, shears, and pins, would have reminded a woman of her household duties. She needed to tend to her family and home via her spinning and sewing. The importance of these duties is enforced by paintings, like this detail from a marriage chest, where the faithful Penelope weaves a shroud for her deceased father-in-law alongside other scenes from Homer's epic poem, The Odyssey. All of these objects and the beautiful, fertile, pious, and dutiful bride herself traveled through the town from her father's home to that of her new husband, often accompanied by a public procession of friends and, rel and relations. One of these processions is represented in this fresco. The bride, who's here in red on a white horse with a wonderful crown on her head, is shown as part of a public ritual that established the new marital alliance to all who saw her pass. She needed a way to transport her dowry goods during this ritual, and that's where marriage chests, the type of object examined so well in this exhibition, come in. 
we can see another similar procession in this detail from the front of a marriage chest with an actual chest identified by its painted short end carried on the back of the straining servant at the far right. Right here, if you look carefully, this guy sort of bringing up the end of the procession has a, a chest on his back full of objects. Here again, we can use the example of Marco Parenti and Caterina Strozzi to understand Florentine practice. Marco's careful memoranda indicates that he bought chests of various sizes, though none can be identified today. Like Marco, most men sent their future brides small caskets filled with some of the objects I just described. These caskets might be quite simple, like the unpainted wood example at the top left there from the back of the portrait, one of the portraits I showed you. Or they could be made of carved ivory or bone, as on the bottom left. Or a shaved wood car curled around a base, capped with a matching lid and painted with romantic images, as at top right. Or they might have applied molded gesso, what we call pastilla, and um, executed with narratives, like the casket from the exhibition at the bottom right with the story of the ancient Roman hero Marco Curzio. Although Marco Parenti noted the purchase of at least one small casket for Caterina, he didn't describe its appearance or contents. And his, meticul his otherwise meticulous accounts only describe the construction, not the paintings, of Caterina's larger pair of marriage chests. The wood, the gilding, and the actual size of these chests were what determined their price. One subject painted on it would have cost as much as another, so Marco, like so many other Florentine men documenting their expenses, felt no need to describe the actual paintings at length, which is quite unfortunate for us. Nor did he describe the pair of larger marriage chests he bought. These larger chests varied in appearance, but usually had instructive images at front and sides relating to the ideal behavior of a Renaissance bride or sometimes her groom or future children. Some had applied ornament like this one with a tournament scene that you can see in the exhibition. In Florence around the time of Marco and Caterina's marriage, marriage chests were usually painted and sometimes gilt on all sides. This partially reconstructed example from nearby Siena, also in the exhibition, is painted with a procession, um, seen here, of love and chastity. Sometimes we only have the front panels, like these three, also from the exhibition, painted with scenes from mythology and Roman history. Some chests were painted with subjects related to the virtues expressed in the dowry and counter-dowry objects we saw earlier, like the story of Diana at the top, which advocated chastity for the bride. At middle and bottom, the stories of Trajan and the Trojan War would have dictated virtuous behavior for the groom instead of the bride. This is a rare example of an almost entirely intact and quite extravagant chest from this era, painted with a contemporary battle scene. Its inner lid, shown unfortunately only in black and white, but the top there, when you open it up, was painted to resemble expensive fabric. Other chests had paintings of nude or nearly nude couples on their inside lids, like these two, the figures serving as sort of hidden talismans to encourage sexuality and procreation, only visible when the wife or the husband opened the chest to retrieve the items stored inside. Side panels were also painted to continue or respond to the narrative painted on the long front panels, like these of Apollo and Daphne, and Paramus and Thisbe, also in the exhibition. Florentine artists were eager to showcase their skills and increase their incomes by producing marriage chests to meet this great demand, and the variety and beauty of these objects give us a good sense of how colorful a Florentine bedchamber could be, as well as how didactic. These images were intended to instill ideal behavior. Marco Parenti's purchases for his marriage to Caterina Strozzi were completed by early 1448, when he gave Caterina a ring and they agreed to be husband and wife in front of a group of witnesses. A similar ceremony may be represented in this detail from a marriage chest, ostensibly representing the triumph of David and Saul, where a couple face each other in Renaissance costume, surrounded by a crowd of onlookers meant to represent the Old Testament David, but instead, seeming to be Renaissance citizens. We're looking especially here at the exchange of a ring in their hands. Most marriage rings have been lost, melted down, or reworked for other purposes in the intervening centuries, like much metalware from this era. 
But we know women often had several marriage rings, as seen in this detail from a portrait I showed you earlier today. One of the surviving examples is this pyramid-cut diamond in a gold setting inscribed around the, the hoop, Lorenzo to Lena Lena. The woman's name was probably, a, the name Lena Lena was probably a shortened form of her given name, maybe Elena or Madalena, and it may have been inscribed twice as a term of endearment or to better fit with Lorenzo's longer name on the other side of the ring. The silver ring inscribed with the names Caterina and Nicola may fit into this category too. Other rings with romantic inscriptions, clasped hands, or profile heads like this one likewise seem associated with marriage from this period. In Renaissance Florence, the ring ceremony, this exchange of rings to signify the new marriage, was followed by a public banquet with a variety of meats, fish, pasta, cakes, wine, and even wafers made from flour, sugar, and eggs heated in a fire between two iron tongs. This detail from a Flemish manuscript at the bottom includes a woman at a, at a hearth holding a set of these irons in her hand. I don't know why she's got the handle going into the flame, but <laughs> a little confused, but she's taken out the wafer right here. And that's an example from the V&A in London where they have actually several dozen of these fabulous, heavy, large iron 